Um, good morning, I'm Julian Lim. I'm Associate Professor of History here in Chippers. Um, and I'm just going to be, um, I have the honor of introducing our speakers uh, this morning, um, and I will help uh, moderate the discussion afterwards. Um, but um, I'm going to introduce our speakers in the order in which they, they will be speaking. So first we have Shamara Alassan. Um, she's Assistant Professor of Religious Studies with a focus on the Black experience in the Americas and in the School of Historical, Philosophical and Religious Studies here at ASU. Uh, she completed her PhD in Africana Studies at Brown University. Her current work on African, Africana women's radical epistemologies focuses on the ways in which Rastafari women use liberty, liberty sorry, to build Pan-African communities and combat anti-Black gendered racism, religious discrimination, and racial capitalism in Ghana, Jamaica, and Ethiopia. Her manuscript, Remembering the Maternal Goddess, Rastafari Women's Intellectual History and Activism in the Pan-African World, the winner of the 2019 National Women's Association and the University of Illinois Press First Book Prize. After um, Shamara, we will have Stan Mervis, Stanley Mervis. Um, he is Associate Professor of History and the Harold and Jean Grossman Chair of Jewish Studies here in Shippers at ASU. He's the author of The Jews of 18th Century Jamaica, a testamentary, history of, a testamentary History of a Diaspora in Transition, which came out with uh, Yale University Press in 2020. Then last but not least, we have Alan Shane Billingham. Um, he is Assistant Professor of History here in Shippers at ASU. He received his doctoral degree in history from the University of Maryland. His first uh, book, uh, multi-award winning, um, Oaxaca Resurgent, Indigeneity, Development, and Inequality in 20th Century Mexico, came out with Stanford University Press in 2021, and traces the contested history of Mexican Indianista policy and how indigenous people of Southern Mexico advocated for alternative forms of development and anti-colonial education. The American Society of Ethnohistory selected his book for its Best Book Award in 2022, and the Conference on Latin American History selected Walker Resurgent for its 2022 Maria Elena Martinez Prize in Mexican History as well. So um, we, we welcome all of you here, and we are appreciative of uh, you joining us for this conversation. Um, and now I will turn it over to, to Shamara to, to begin the conversation. Give thanks to the ancestors for the ability to share my work with all of you today. Give thanks to the organizers of Genocide Awareness Week. Special thanks to Tim Peel and Jill, and and for the invitation to share space uh, with all of you and my fellow panelists. And give thanks to all of you who are present and joining us virtually. As many who have presented before me, I acknowledge the genocide against the people whose lands we are occupying and stand in solidarity with struggles for reparations and land back demands of Native, Indigenous, and First Nation peoples. Okay. Um, the first slide. Thank you. April 13, 2023, 16 year old Ralph Yarl, who you can see pictured here, was going to pick up his siblings when he rang the wrong doorbell in Kansas City, Missouri and was shot by an 84-year-old white man, Andrew D. Lester. Thankfully, you all survived, but it was only after mounting pressure that Lester was formally charged with a crime. Unfortunately, what happened to you all is not unique and is the expected outcome of an anti-Black and white supremacist nation like the United States. In my presentation to you today, I will argue that the genocide against African and African diasporic people predates the term genocide, but genocide is a useful framework that Black communities have used to think about and advocate against their state-sanctioned and socially accepted murder and oppression. When I say Africa, I refer to the indigenous peoples of the continent of Africa, and when I say the African diaspora, I refer to the millions of people who were trafficked during the transatlantic slave trade and held captive in racial hereditary enslavement. When starting with the enslavement of African and African diasporic people, the charge of genocide diagnoses systemic generational sanctioning of violence that becomes a normal precondition for and a function of governance, the formation of the nation state and civic and social institutions. The normalized violence that, that occurred against black people during enslavement became a durable function of white supremacy and anti-black racism in the contemporary moment. And the last part of my presentation will call for uh, discussions of reparations, um, formerly the frameworks from the African Union, CARICOM, and the United Nations as forming a metrics for ending anti-Black genocide and establishing justice. You can go to the next slide. 
We charge genocide. Out of the inhumane black ghettos of American cities, out of the cotton plantations of the South, comes this record of mass slayings on the basis of race, of lives deliberately warped and distorted by the willful creation of conditions, making for premature death, poverty, and disease. It is a record that calls aloud for condemnation, for an end to the ter these terrible injustices that constitute a daily and ever-increasing violation of the United Nations Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. We maintain, therefore, that the oppressed Negro citizens of the United States, segregated, discriminated against, and long target of violence, suffer from genocide as the result of the consistent, conscious, and unified policies of every branch of government, govern, government unquote. These are the opening sentences in the landmark 1951 document, We Charge Genocide, the historic petition to the United Nations for relief from a crime of the United, Go United States government against the Negro people. Led by William Patterson, who was the National Executive Secretary of the Civil Rights Congress, the 1951 delegation to the United Nations charged the U.S. government with genocide under the 1948 United Nations General Assembly Resolution. The 1948 U.N. General Assembly's resolution defined genocide as, quote, any of the following acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group, such as A, killing members of the group, B, causing serious bodily harm or mental harm to members of the group, C, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, D, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, and E, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. In the 1951 We Charge Genocide campaign, Patterson and members of the delegation meticulously detail the ways African diasporic people have experienced each facet of the UN resolution on uh, genocide's frameworks um, and therefore have a legal ground to charge the United States government. Joel Vargas, scholar of African and African diasporic Diaspora Studies and Genocide Studies scholar draws from the 1951 We Charge Genocide campaign to argue for an understanding of genocide as, quote, multifaceted phenomenon that understands systemic, social, juridical, legislative, militarized, economic, psychological, and medical policies and practices in everyday acts of violence as constitutive of white supremacy and anti-Black racism. Vargas writes, quote, Approach from various angles, genocide allows us to understand seemingly disparate phenomena as they relate to each other, contributing to the continued oppression and death of Black people in Africa and its diaspora. Therefore, it cannot, therefore, it cannot be an effective political strategy to combat anti-Black racism without a deep and broad, indeed global, perspective on the multiple facets of genocidal discrimination. Nor can there be a sound and ethical research agenda without on the ground engaging with real problems as they are experienced by real people and real community organizations. Um, next slide, please. We're convening all week to discuss genocide and there is state sanctioned genocide happening in the United States right now against people who look like me. The 1951 charge of genocide inspired organizers in the 2014 We Charge Genocide campaign to go to the United Nations Committee Against Torture as, quote, a grassroots intergenerational effort to center the voices and experiences of young people who, who, most targeted, who are most targeted by police violence in Chicago, unquote. Black organizers in Brazil and elsewhere have also used the term genocide to discuss the multidimensional anti-Black policies and practices. Even though We Charge Genocide is an important organizing tool for African diaspora people, the problem with genocide studies, as Joelle Vargas argues, is the lack of attention given to genocides against African diaspora people, which are part of creating the conditions for the normalization and routinization of genocidal policies, practices that may function beyond direct intention, but become part of the thought pattern that devalues Black life. He argues, quote, white supremacy and anti-Black racism are genocidal, complementing their most obvious final manifestations, white supremacy and anti-Black racism also work through silence, inaction, and ignorance. White supremacy and anti-Black racism happen both because of what we and others do as well as what we and others do not do. Consequently, silence, inaction, and ignorance are, are as genocidal as the most racist, racist acts and thoughts, unquote. The murders of Breonna Taylor on March 13th and George Floyd on May 25th, 2020, and the numerous other unarmed Black people 
uh, and the ensuing pro protest of that summer was the first time that some had the occasion to reflect on racism as a public health issue that disproportionately threatens the safety and security of Black people. We're living in challenging times. Discussions of genocide must continue to confront questions of racism, white supremacy, and complicity of governmental bodies, civic, social, religious, and educational institutions. The contemporary struggle against critical race theory, counter narratives of empire, and the continuance of white supremacist settler colonial governance perpetuate the conditions that normalize genocide against Black people. In her essay on mourning, Claudia Rankine illustrates the ways the movement for Black lives is a movement for national mourning by forcing the public to recognize and uplift the lives of those murdered by the state. But recognition is only the first step. We need to atone for our Black death and offer reparations for the enduring harms caused to families. We have been taught to abstract Black death to explain it away as singular rather than collective. We must sit with this moment with the, and with the history of harm against Black people with the reality of too many Black deaths all the time. Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Ahmaud Aubrey, Atiana Jefferson, Betty Jones, Botham John, India Kager, Cassandra Bland, Mike Brown, Trayvon Martin, and there are too many names to uh, fully give honor to everyone who has passed. And COVID-19 also revealed some of the deep uh, necropolitical logics of this genocidal project. Um, last slide, and thank you. How can we think of reparations as a life ethic that informs the way we respond to anti-Black genocide? The African Union defines the notion of reparative justice as, quote, the effective and adequate financial as well as non-financial redress of restitution for violations or losses suffered. The five forms of reparations they specify are material, restoration of land and monetary compensation, healing, truth and rec reconciliation, rehabilitative or medical and psychological support, collective or distributive resources for specific communities and moral or the release of information, apologies and public acknowledgement of harm caused. The African Union's 2019 definition of reparations mirrors that of the United Nations. In 2005, the United Nations developed a five-pronged way to understand reparations as the cessation, cessation and guarantees of non-repetition. The schema involves stopping the harm, never repeating the injustice, compensation or the the per perpetrating party's provision of financial redress for harm, restitution and repatriation, or the restoration of those who had been harmed to the place that they had inhabited prior to the harm, which includes reinstatement of citizenship, identity, and freedom, satisfaction, or the result of repair for emotional, mental, or reputational injury, and rehabilitation, or the provision of legal, medical, and psychological and other services. In 2013, the CARICOM Reparations Committee established a 10-point plan for reparations based on the history and contemporary experiences of transatlantic slavery, genocide, and colonialism that the European governments perpetrated against enslaved Africans and indigenous populations. It also acknowledges that after the abolition of slavery, slave owners and those who were not enslaved were compensated by European states. Furthermore, Europeans perpetuated a racial apartheid that was, quote, designed to perpetuate suffering upon the emancipated and survivors of genocide, unquote. And they refused to acknowledge, apologize, and provide provisions for their victims or their descendants. The 10-point reparation plans includes, one, a formal, a full formal apology, two, repatriation or the provision of the legal way to resettle enslaved Africans in their homelands should they desire to go there, three, an indigenous people's development plan to redress the genocide of indigenous peoples, four cultural institutions, five public health crisis alert to restore healthcare systems in specific regions, six illiteracy eradication, seven African knowledge programs, eight psychological re rehabilitation, nine technology transfer, and 10 debt cancellation. These bids for reparations by CARICOM, the African Union, and the United Nations recognize the cost to human subjects for the harms that primarily European countries and the United States have inflicted. In 2021, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, said, quote, I'm calling on all states to stop denying and start dismantling racism, to end impunity and build trust, to listen to the voices of people of African descent, and to confront past legacies and deliver redress, unquote. The national and international communities have spoken. European nations and the United States must be held to account with We Charge Genocide Campaigns, AU, CARICOM, and UN reparations metrics because they have perpetuated racist disinformation, genocide, economic disenfranchisement, and crimes against African and African diaspora people. The genocidal crimes against humanity committed by the United States and Europe are superseded only by the violence they have committed against the planet, the atmosphere, and all planetary life forms. 
Thank you very much for allowing me to share some brief uh, reflections uh, with you this afternoon. I look forward to engaging in the conversation. Oh, thank you very much. It's a, that's a lot to think about uh, for now. Um, I just uh, wanted to maybe define the concept of diaspora using the Jewish experience, specifically the pre-modern Jewish experience, and I'll explain why I want to focus on pre-modernity to try to explain some of the key features of diaspora to arrive at some kind of definition and, um, and, and better understand how diasporas interact with, within themselves and among other diasporas and among people that are empowered. So following um, Kim Butler had, has a very useful article. She's a scholar of the Pan-African diaspora where she sort of taxonomizes diaspora in three crucial ways. Um, number one is dispersion, and that's kind of obvious. Uh, number two is subalternity. Diasporas require or need some kind of marginalization, some kind of persecution, enslavement. Um, a, a diaspora can't be empowered. Um, and so that is, otherwise it starts to look a little bit like empire. And so th that's a key feature. And then number three in Ken Butler's definitions is cohesion. She describes it as a longing for return, um, some kind of cultural cohesion that cuts across the, the, the dispersed communities. And so I'm going to use my 10 minutes, which I should be, uh, I'm gonna be using my 10 minutes to use the Jewish experience to kind of fill in you know, de define those three categories and how they apply specifically to Jewish diasporas in the pre-modern world. Uh, before I do that, though, there's a, there's a problem of terminology a little bit. In Jewish studies, uh, the concept of diaspora is tfutsot, right, which is um, dispersion, really. And that's a secular concept. That's a concept that I see as applying to the Jewish people, the dispersion of the Jewish people. And that ought not be confused or mingled with the concept of galut, which is exile which is a theological, spiritual condition uh, that's specific to Judaism as a religion of being dislocated from the land of Israel, from the temple in Jerusalem, not being able to fulfill the sacrificial cult as described in the Bible. That's the condition of being in Galut, of being in exile. So I'm really not speaking about that. And I'm a strong believer in really trying to separate Judaism from the Jewish people and looking at this, looking at the, the concept of diaspora just historically and not, not theologically. Uh, another really important tension that runs through Jewish studies and our, in our, in our abilities to define diaspora is, is the lacrimose versus anti-lacrimose conceptions of Jewish history, which is, uh, you know, but, uh, Sela Barone, who was the first professional historian of the Jewish experience in the United States, uh, who, who, has a, who casts a very long shadow over Jewish studies here at ASU, um, was an advocate, really, of this anti-lacrimose narrative. You shouldn't be studying Jewish history as this perpetual veil of tears, as persecution running from victimhood to victimhood, from persecution to persecution. By doing that, you're robbing the Jewish experience of its richness, of its creativity, of its perseverance. Uh, and so that's where Sale of Barone was coming from. Now, it's, it's almost impossible, though, to study diaspora without some lacrimosity. Uh, a lot of Jewish diaspora is fueled by expulsion. Um, and so this, that becomes one of the great tensions, right? How do you look at, uh, you know, how do you uh, try to weigh the persecutory aspects of Jewish history against the creative and robust parts of Jewish history? So with this in mind, I might propose a fourth category to Kim Butler's uh, taxonomy, and that is hybridity, hybridity and, um, or maybe entanglement. A diaspora may require some kind of hybridity with the people that you live under or the people that you live among, uh, in how diasporas interact with each other underneath, the, uh, uh, underneath people that are in power, um, creates um, a transformational, uh, transformational uh, cultural features in, in, within diasporas. So these are um, kind of the, the, the tensions that I'm playing with and why I wanted to focus on pre-modernity is because this might not be a popular position here, but, uh, but I, I, I'm a, I feel that overly focusing on the Holocaust, which I think we do, has um, in a lot of ways uh, erased Jewish history before the Holocaust, and, and, and especially the lacrimose parts of Jewish history, the suffering. And it, and it comes to, the reality is, is that a lot of people, especially in the United States, and a lot of Jews, I would say majority of Jews, 
really don't know anything about Jews other than they were the victims of the Holocaust. Um, and I was even asked that at a, at a public lecture one time, somebody asked, it was a non-Jewish audience, what, what else happened to the Jews other than the Holocaust? And then you have to say, well, I mean, what are the hundreds of examples of expulsion, persecution, marginalization, dispossession should you include in that? Um, but, but, it, but it really made it clear in my mind that we've overemphasized the Holocaust in a lot of ways, and that has had a detrimental in, impact and under, an understanding and appreciating who the Jewish people are, what they are, other than just victims of Nazi uh, uh, genocide. Um, so, so let me go through uh, Kim Butler's definitions in about six minutes and plug in, plug in the Jewish experience to that. So the first is dispersion. So I think uh, with the, in, in the Jew, in Jewish historical pre-modern experience, there's a lot to be, to be said there. So in very, in very uh, wide sweeping terms, if you go back to late antiquity, I think the rule is that Jews go where Romans go. Uh, so this is why you end up having a, a pretty much the entirety of the Mediterranean populated with Jews in late antiquity, especially Anatolia, Alexandria, Ifriqiya, which is Tunisia, and Spain especially. And in fact, by the early Middle Ages, there may have even been a Jewish majority in Granada under the Visigoths. Uh, so Jews were heavily, you know, uh, sort of had heavily populated the Mediterranean. And that's in addition to the long-standing community in Babylonia, which Jews call Babylonia, which is Iraq, which has uh, antiquity that goes before late antiquity. And um, it continues to be the most stable and definitive and authoritative community in the world going through the entirety of pre-modernity. Up until the 19, you know, up until modernity really, um, does the Iraqi Jewish community, specifically in Baghdad, at least until 1258 when Baghdad is destroyed, uh, that is the, the most central Jewish community in the world. And I would also add to late antiquity is the, the beginnings of Jewish presence in Yemen in the Arabian Peninsula. Now, this is uh, controversial where these Jews come from. They could be related to Sabians that were earlier there. Likely, they were coming as part of a Roman incursion into, uh, into Arabia. The Romans had military presence in, uh, in the Arabian Peninsula. So if Jews go where Romans go, that might be why they're also in Yemen. Um, and then and another community is, is that of Uzbekistan in Central Asia, probably starts to emerge in the Roman period in the nascent Silk Routes. By the early Middle Ages, those communities are pretty well defined, and that ends up becoming Persian Jewry, but also Bukharan Jewry, Uzbek Jewry later on, which the second largest community in the world is here in Phoenix uh, of Bukharan Jews. So that's a, that's a snapshot of the, of the of late antiquity. In the Middle Ages, things changed. Baghdad remains the staple central community of Jews in the world, but you have also Jewish militias that are active in the Galilee that are, that are together operating with the Persians against the Byzantines. Jews engage in terrorism against the Byzantines. They destroy churches in reaction to anti-Jewish legislation. Um, but, but really, the main communities in the Middle Ages are Spain and the new one, Ashkenaz, that comes from Italy and emerges in the Rhineland and Northern Europe. Um, and so now that, that's the difference between Ashkenazi and Sephardi Jewry, the Spanish versus German Jewry. Um, German Jewry faces their own problems in the early Middle Ages that were destroyed during the Crusades and, and mass martyrdom. Um, and, uh, but, but Italy, Southern Italy also has a presence in North Africa. Very, each one of these communities wants autonomy from the Jewish uh, authorities in Baghdad in the, in the Middle Ages. Uh, the uh, everything really changes with early modernity. Early modernity marks a major um, population shift in Jewish history. Spain, the expulsion from Spain in 1492, which affected at least 20,000 people went to Morocco, probably another 40 to 50,000 Jews go to Portugal and from there on to the Ottoman Empire. So it affects thousands and thousands of Jews in 1492. The result of that is a shifting of Sfarad, of, of uh, medieval Spain, that population's to the, the, the Mediterranean to the Ottoman Mediterranean and alternatively from Portugal to Western Europe and to the Caribbean and to the Americas. So you have these new diasporas that emerge from Spain. Uh, the, um, and Ashkenaz too, because of the Black Death violence, Jews are scapegoated in 1348 for the Black Death. The community of Nuremberg is killed entirely. Um, and, and then also in Northern Spain, there were serious violence against Jews as a result of the Black Death. That was on the heels of, of uh, violence against Jews in 1320s and the pastoral violence and the Shepherd's Crusade. Um, so the, the, the uh, Ashkenaz is liquidated too over the course of the end of the course of the 14th and 15th century, the Black Death violence. So that migration, that, that, that community really migrates to Poland, Lithuania. And that 
that starts to be what is Ashkenaz. You may have, may have wondered, why do Poland Lithuanian Jews speak German? You know, because they were of German Jewry. Initially, they're Ashkenazi. So you have, so the early modernity and uh, Jewish studies is really easily demarcated because of these big population dislocations because of the expulsion from Spain. And another critical uh, feature here is Italy. Um, and that is because the expulsion from Spain didn't even affect all of Spain. Navarre was spared an expulsion initially, but it did affect uh, the southern kingdoms of the Spanish kingdoms of Italy, like Naples and Sicily. So uh, the result of that is Jews from southern Italy are pushed to the north, and then there's an expulsion from German lands. Those Jews are pushed to the south. So with early modernity, northern Italy becomes one of the great um, points of Jewish creativity and Jewish location and Jewish settlement. Venice and Venice and Ferrara and, and places like that. Uh, so th th these are some of the big diasporic uh, changes that are happening. Now, the next, the next category for Kim Butler I'll, I'll talk about is cohesion. So is there anything, here the question is what makes an Yemeni Jew the same people as an Ashkenazi Jew? They have different cultural ways, they look different for sure. Um, they speak very different languages. What makes them the same people? And so I think that the, the where the cohesion comes in to, 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 in, to plug it into Kim Butler's definition is one, one is in Hebrew, the use of Hebrew as a liturgical language, that the Semitic language that cuts across all Jews, even if they're not speaking it. Judaism as a religion has a lot of similar features across all of these different diasporas, especially messianic concepts. So I think that really helps to, to, to add value or to, to uh, expand what, what Kim Butler was saying about uh, longing for return. Every Jewish community shares some kind of messianic uh, hope features. There are messianic movements in Yemen, even in the 12th century, Maimonides gets involved in, um, and various other messianic movements uh, that emerge. And this messianism is an abode of the dispossessed, of the, of, of the subaltern. It's a hope that one day fortunes will be reversed and maybe will become the persecutors. There's a vengeful element also to messianism, which is part of a Part of what it means to be a, a diaspora is hope for vengeance one day. This is very common in Shia diaspora communities and other communities that have that are dispossessed. Um, and now the, the, the subalternity issue, I don't think that needs explanation why Jews are not empowered. But, but you, that could be pushed back on a little bit because Judaism is empowered in some ways in the Middle Ages. The Khazars, the Khemurites, these are non ethnically non-Jews who have kingdoms in Yemen and in Central Asia. But the, the, that are that, that use Judaism as, as a state religion, but they themselves are not Jewish. So you can argue: Were Jews ever empowered? Was Judaism empowered? What does that mean for a diasporic status? Uh, to be fair, lots of ethnic Jews lived in the Khazar Kingdom in Central Asia, who were fleeing Byzantine persecution. So it's a much more complicated question than just that, than uh, about empowered or not empowered, or Judaism versus Jewish people. But to, to, uh, to, to further expand on my complaint, I guess that the Holocaust has sort of ruined all other tragedies that Jews, it, 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 I, I wanted to focus on two bookending tragedies of the, um, the 14th century that, um, that have really been lost to Jewish collective memory and to popular memory of the Jews altogether. And I'll end with this, and that was number one, 1306. So we talked about black death violence in the 1340s. The, um, uh, the pastoral violence in the 1320s, but 1306, probably 100,000 Jews were affected by an by a expulsion decree, which you don't even really know the motivations, from France that didn't just uh, apply to Ile de France, but also from um, many other provinces um, around the Ile de France. So um, th this was a huge upheaval of people. And then the trauma added to that of being readmitted, having your property co-opted, you know, because Jews are serf, serfs to the kings. That's how it works. They're serving Camerai in the Middle Ages. They're the property of, uh, empire, of, of um, emperors and kings. Uh, so it was a way of co-opting Jewish wealth. But this left a really important resonance. And there's at least a half a dozen Hebrew sources, not the least of which from the raw bug from uh, Gersonides, who, who talked about the trauma of 1306 but this is lost to Jewish collective memory. Uh, 1492, that's a big one. The Holocaust has been in Khmelnytsky massacres in Ukraine um, in the 17th century, but 1306 uh, is not really remembered. And the other one, and I'll end with this, is 1391. We, we think so much about 1492, but 1391 was one of the most traumatic events that happened in Jewish history ever. It was the largest uh, massacre of Jews to that point, and probably the largest massacre of Jews until the Holocaust. 
um, when uh, rioting broke out in Sevilla and then spread throughout all of Castile and parts of uh, Valencia and in uh, Aragon and in uh, Catalon Catalonia. Uh, all hundreds of communities affected, um, easily 12,000 Jews uh, dead from mass violence and another 5,000 probably uh, killed themselves out of martyrdom and at least over 100,000 Jewish convicts. Um, in 1391, this gave, which, be, which is the beginning of the Converso crisis that's going to culminate in the expulsion of Jews in 1492. Um, so I, just, I, I think uh, 1391 and 1306, these are huge events that are basically lost uh, to, I think, Jewish collective memory. And, uh, and I just submit that as a, um, to be agreed with or disagreed with. Um, and then I'll, I'll leave my other, uh, my other category of hybridity off for now. But thank you very much for your, your attention. <laughs> All right, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, my name is Shane Dillingham, as uh, Julian mentioned. Uh, thank you for having me uh, on the panel. Um, and thank you, Tim uh, Lingil, for the invitation. I was a relatively last minute addition, so I'm uh, pinch hitting here. Uh, but hopefully I can uh, say a few things. Um, I was invited to think about the concepts of uh, genocide and diaspora as they relate to indigeneity. Um, in indigenous people's histories. And so I thought I might share a few uh, reflections on that. I do I just want to congratulate the organizers uh, for Genocide Awareness Week. I think it's a really important um, program uh, and set of uh, events and programs. And to think about genocide as having kind of multiple histories and uh, overlapping histories, I think is really uh, important. Um, and, and, you know, as we used to say in Alabama, you're doing the Lord's work. Uh, and so, um, so yeah, and I also really appreciate you know um, both uh, Shamara and Stan's comments, but uh, you know Stan's kind of invitation to think about diaspora as a concept for me is useful because I think when we are coming from different disciplinary um, backgrounds or different uh, subject areas, Stan mentioned a few uh, historical moments that I am not familiar with. Uh, you know that that those times of conceptual discussions can be really generative. So maybe um, my comments can can. Um, go in that direction. I thought I would say something about genocide and native history, and then say something about thinking about diaspora and forced removal in native history. So, um, and then we can open up for a conversation. Um, so in terms of genocide um, in native history, you know, when I teach, uh, I teach a course called Native Histories of the Americas that tries to think about native history uh, from a hemispheric perspective, uh, rather than taking the nation state uh, you know, U.S. Native American history or Mexican Native American history, we try to think hemispherically because colonialism was a hemispheric event, right? Conquest in particular. And so when I teach conquest in 1492 uh, to students, we oftentimes use uh, a book chapter, and this is a relatively recent um, book on Native history, that describes this period, uh, the chapter title is Encounter, right? So like the period of 1492, European conquest of the Americas, it's described as encounter. And, um, and so, you know, the students are asked to read, hopefully they read some of that chapter. Uh, we discuss it and they, uh, I asked them why they, the author chose to, to title this chapter on 1492, Encounter, right? And they're like, you know, they kind of start with some, you know, uh, well, this is about, you know, there's different people meeting and, uh, and I'm like, well, you know, why don't they call it conquest? And then, you know, they say, well, there's, uh, you know, if they've read closely, there's cultural exchange that's happening. And so, um, you know, they, they try to, I think, approximate what the authors are, you know, trying to do with that title, right? That using encounter rather than say conquest. But, you know, I always respond to them. And I say, well, like, you know, if I, walked out of the classroom here and was crossing, you know, University Ave and got hit by a bus, would you say I had an encounter, <laughs> right? Um, because, it, you know, we just look at the numbers, right? And we look at the pre-conquest uh, uh, population versus the post-conquest population. There is, a, uh, there is something more than just an encounter happening, right? There is uh, a genocide, there is a mass e extinction event, uh, in many ways, population collapse, if uh, the social scientists use that term. And so, you know, I, I think that the part of the challenge, of course, and this isn't to like, um, 
um, uh, dismiss the author of this textbook, which I assign and use and respect. But of course, it, it raises this question of, of what are the interpretive lenses that we bring to these questions, right? So there is a mass violence that is part of colonialism against Native peoples, it clearly constitutes what we understand to be genocide. But that also um, raises the question of what are Native peoples, um, what is their power, what is their ability to shape the historical moment, right? And so the author clearly wants to kind of balance question of, you know, the violence of conquest with Native peoples' ability to persist, to be resilient, um, uh, to resist empire, to put limits on it. And I think that is um, something I'm trying to wrestle with in my own work, but I think also students, right, are trying to think about is when we're describing powerful structures of violence, right, of white supremacy or genocide, um, how do we balance acknowledging and naming that and calling that out with uh, the project of saying, you know, but people are not just victims, right? They are victims, but Native people are doing all sorts of other things. Uh, they're um, resisting, they're putting limits on, et cetera. And so I feel like that is what I'm trying to figure out. And I want my students to think about that as we think about Native history, um, because that also allows us to try to think in more complex ways about our own present, right? And Native politics in the present involves us being both victims, but also uh, agents of history and, and um, uh, agents of making a, a different futures. And so uh, I'd be happy to talk more about uh, conquest uh, if people want the discussion. Um, in terms of diaspora, I mean, you know, diaspora is a concept that's being picked up more and more in Native history and Native and Indigenous studies. And it's obviously, uh, I think, learning from other fields in important ways. Certainly, Native history uh, is inextricably linked for, with like the forced removal of Native peoples from their lands, right? The dispossession of their lands. Um, and so forced removal is a constant. It seems like there would be uh, lots of parallels that we could make to other people's uh, histories. Um, and, you know, but these histories, you know, for my own family is uh, originally from what is now Mississippi, right? And my family is forcibly removed in the 1830s to what was Indian territory, what is now the state of Oklahoma. And um, that, that history is a history of dispossession of forced removal. Um, it's also a history, I just, I just, uh, recorded a lecture on this. I'm teaching my first online course at ASU, so I just recorded a lecture. So I was thinking about this. That history is also tied up in the history of uh, anti-Black racism and slavery. And so some of the people, and this was not shared with me when I was a child, but some of the people, Native people, uh, a small minority of Native elites who travel the Trail of Tears are traveling with slaves, with enslaved people of African descent, right? And so these are these, you know, um, uh, uh, Native people who are being dispossessed of their lands, some of whom who have participated in chattel slavery are uh, moving to Indian, Tory, Indian territory with their slaves. Some of them will eventually side with the Confederacy uh, uh, during the Civil War. And so, you know, these are these kind of overlapping histories. Of course, uh, there are native peoples and nations that are, were in Indian territory prior to the arrival of the Chickasaws or the Choctaws or the Creeks, right? And so that, that is also a, a kind of a story of dispossession. Um, and you know the schemes for removal of native peoples do not stop in the 19th century, right? So I, you know, I wrote uh, recently wrote this book on on the 20th century uh, kind of indigenous experiences, and I use Southern Mexico as a case study. But um, across the Americas, there are projects for the relocation of native peoples, right? Um, in the United States, there's something called the Urban Indian Relocation Program, which is meant to basically destroy reservations by moving native peoples to uh, urban centers like LA or Chicago or uh, Seattle. Um, and in, in Latin America, there's a number of programs that are about moving native peoples from their traditional lands to places for increased economic activity, et cetera. Right? And these are all justified in uh, kind of progressive languages, right? But, uh, you know, um, are part of a broader pattern of the elimination of native peoples uh, in the Americas and their disbursement, right? And so, I don't know, how long have I been talking? I've been talking for about, about 10, minutes. 10 minutes. So I'll try to, so I think, you know, I could talk more about that, but, but there are ways in which people are creatively responding to these plans for our resettlement, right? So in the United States, 
uh, there are native people who already are living in like LA and they like, they find out about this urban Indian relocation program. So they go back to Oklahoma and they get the check from the government and then they just go back to LA, right? So there's ways, there are these kind of uh, diasporic Indian communities in urban areas that are just kind of taking advantage of it. Uh, and then of course, you know, there are um, indigenous diasporas that spread across the Americas in the 20th century that are also responding to the economic pressures of uh, capitalist development in which say indigenous people from Southern Mexico find themselves now living in Northern Mexico, in Mexico City, if you've seen the film Roma, uh, uh, Southern California, all the way to Vancouver, right? A kind of creation of a massive indigenous diaspora that uh, is one that maintains links to their uh, traditional lands, but also is this incredibly cosmopolitan and of self-conscious diaspora. And so um, those are a few examples of what I'm trying to think about in terms of diaspora and indigeneity. I'd be happy to, to talk with you all in the Q&A. Thank you. So a lot for us to sort of process and try to bring together um, common themes of obviously genocide and diaspora um, involving these different groups, different histories, but this idea of overlapping when you're thinking about um, these histories. So it's been very, um, uh, I think it was a lot to maybe talk about and think about. Um, I will let the audience ask questions if anyone has any that come immediately to mind. You know, everyone can take notes. Uh, okay. Yeah, it, it seems to me one one theme that perhaps links all, all three panelists is that um, the last part is a recurring thing, right? Um, so for, for the native groups who are uh, displaced, they often have a long history of displacement from other places, right? It's a, it's a constant cycle. In, in, in Africa, where right, the, the violence that the slave trade brings is often uh, like, you know, a violence that, that uh, repeats a circle of, of, of displacement and introduces is absolutely obvious, right? One diaspora might lead to another. So I was wondering, would it make sense for you guys to, to play with this idea of this is not one diaspora, this is a continuous cycle of, of displacement. Yeah, uh, I, I, yeah, yeah, that's that's a helpful uh, thought. Yeah, this is com com obviously ongoing uh, reality for I think all the peoples that are discussed here, uh, and and um, yeah, yeah, and I would, you know, and, and uh, I, I I had a thought, but it fled it fled through my uh, it, it, uh, it was a fleeting thought apparently. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, uh, one thing I, I I tend to talk about diasporas. I don't even like the term Jewish diaspora as a singular. Uh, to me, it doesn't uh, really, doesn't have a lot of meaning. I, I, I always write as a plurality. Um, and uh, thinking about Sephardic Jewry is a great example because Sephardic Jewry, you know, have, you have Sephardim, many of whom are left as Jews from Spain that populated the, 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 the Mediterranean. And then you had those that, re, that were conversos that stayed in Spain or in Portugal. And then they populated a whole other region, have a, this very distinct identity. They don't call themselves Sephardim. They call themselves, you know, gente de la Naja, or like they're, they're, they're the Anasal, the men of the nation or something. They're, they speak Portuguese, not Spanish. They have no Ladino. Yet the, the, the origins of that, of the ancestry of those communities are the same. They develop very distinctly. So I think that that's a, a, a good example of ongoing type of developments in diaspora. They branch off. And then as diasporas interact with other diasporas, they transform. Uh, they transform in complexion and phenotype. They transform in cultural features. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's uh, that, that, that subtitle of my book is Diaspora and Transition uh, because it's always changing. It's changing the way it, the way it looks and, and, and thinks. Uh, I, think, I believe you had your hand up. And this might be a little bit along the, the same theme is um, there's kind of a, 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 a homogenized version that we get, meaning, um, you know, Native American culture or indigenous culture, not taking into account all the different tribes or African, uh, uh, you know, diaspora, not thinking about like Caribbean and Cuba and all these other sort of places. So how do you find, uh, what are the challenges of finding identity within that? I think some of the challenges of finding identity in terms of the African diaspora are these histories of continual displacement, 
Um, like a lot of enslaved Africans are taken to the Caribbean first from uh, different parts of the continent. They're taken to uh, places in Latin America. And then um, there's like a seasoning process that uh, occurs and then they're transferred to the United States. So a lot of uh, folks didn't actually come directly to um, the United States, they, there's a perpetual displacement. And then within uh, countries, because of anti-Black violence um, against uh, Black populations, wherever they are, there are displacements within uh, particular nations that also occur. So um, one of the popular uh, massacres uh, that people are only now sort of beginning to know more about is the Tulsa massacre in, in uh, 1921 in Oklahoma, go, um, going back to Oklahoma. Um, and a lot of those folks, uh, survivors were displaced um, to other places. And this, um, if you, there's a, actually a really great uh, film about this called Banished um, that uh, thinks about different communities um, who have been displaced directly because of uh, violent action in uh, the United States. But also the African diaspora involves uh, contemporary uh, migration. Um, so like if you look at somebody like uh, Christina Sharp's book um, on blackness and being, um, she discusses the ways that not only is sort of these internal processes in terms of slavery and uh, state violence are taking place, but you also have these hemispheric uh, violences that are taking place in terms of disaster capitalism, uh, uh, forced economic um, migration for different types of purposes for different purposes, as well as war um, and migration because of different uh, parts who are, uh, different countries who are at war with either each other or civil wars um, that are also displacing people. So the, the formation of identity in terms of blackness is complicated and then not uh, complicated in terms of, there are a lot of different identities within the African diaspora, but then not complicated in terms of there's a shared experience in terms of the way hemispheric white supremacy sort of works to surveil uh, people who are phenotypically black. So you have connected uh, understandings of different types of oppressions that are, are dealt with because of state violence, because of that. so. Yeah. Just piggybacking on this question, I, I, that's something that, so when I, in my work, I work on immigration law um, uh, and a lot of my work involves Chinese immigration and Chinese diaspora and I've always, had this issue about like how diasporas can sometimes suggest a kind of static rightness in terms of you know how do we know what they're all going to different places that there is a commonality and I think uh, Shamara's um, kind of emphasis on um, sort of external pressures and how groups get defined by multiple different kinds of um, external forces but I think Stan's presentation was also helpful in thinking about how the groups themselves might create certain common nodes where they they will place their identity as, as shared. Perhaps that's, I mean, it's probably very contested always, right? But it becomes at least a common space for that com that conversation. In, in my yeah, and I would just, I mean, kind of picking back that, um, you know, uh, in Oaxaca, Mexico, there are, 16 different languages, uh, cultures, people who understand themselves as very different and with healthy kind of rivalries between, you know, Zapotec and Mixtec speaking communities, right? But in the diaspora, right? And because of anti-indigenous racism, all those differences collapse and you're like, you're Oaxacan, right? And, and oftentimes used in a kind of derogatory way, right? And so that is exactly the kind of parallel, right? The kind of complexity and then the kind of homogenization happens oftentimes through the structural racism that people encounter in diaspora. And then maybe, you know, back in the home community, you could appreciate some of that um, diversity. And I mean, the, the Tulsa riot that Shamara mentioned, right? I mean, one, one of the um, causes for that riot was this strong, thriving Black community in Oklahoma. That was in part because in the aftermath of the Civil War, uh, as Native nations who had sided with the Confederacy were forced to give up large amounts of land and, you know, the, the kind of 40 acres and a mule story, right, and the, the failure of Reconstruction. Well, the one place that African Americans do get access to land is Oklahoma, is Native land, right? And so white land often isn't given, right? But in, in the case of Oklahoma native land is. And so this there's this large scale migration of people of African descent into Indian territory and then what will become Oklahoma 
those, there's those folks, there's also free persons who had been enslaved by native nations. And that, you know, eventually, you know, the, the kind of racist backlash that is that, you know, riot is connected to those, those histories. And there's, what is the book that you and I have discussed uh, by Elena Roberts? We've been here all the while. It's called Black Freedom on Native Land. Uh, and it's a kind of looks at these intersections in really thoughtful ways. Thank you, Tim, and then Andrew, and then Hoffa. Thank you for all your contributions. Stan, I agree with you. 1391, 1492, we've been talking about 1391. And Shamara and Shane, um, yeah, genocide studies can be so definitional, right? With gatekeepers of the definition. But we can easily identify ongoing patterns, techniques of destruction of Black and Indigenous people on this continent. And, you know, to think about it, that way, and I, I, I'm hoping the field is changing and turning because Shamar, what you presented, there is more conversation around that. Um, you know, with some, uh, like some scholars, uh, such as Alexander Labatt Hinton, recently wrote that 70 years ago, uh, we charged genocide, that they should have been taken more seriously, right? Um, he's written a book on white supremacy and genocide, that it can happen again, because it has happened here. Right. And so there is uh, Whitman's Hitler's American model, right? Looking at Nuremberg laws and American racial laws. And so I'm hoping the field is changing because we've had gatekeepers kind of keeping this on the periphery, like being like, we can talk about this, but well, it's not quite, big. you know, we go back to Lemkin. Genocide is destruction of a group. And there are these persistent techniques and patterns that continue today with settler colonialism and its legacy and, you know, especially the blood regulation, it's very hard to, um, Shane mentioned, like, how tightly intertwined Indigenous and Black experiences are here with um, settler colonialism and its ongoing legacies. Yeah. Oh, I think Andrew had his hand up and then My, my uh, question comment is, is that, uh, first of all, uh, I'm really, it turns out I'm really interested in this, listening to you guys. I realize the extent to which what I'm doing fits under this sort of rubric, and that I'm studying the uh, African diaspora that sort of uh, has existed since the 16th century. And, uh, and, 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 and and a strategy, and this is where my question comes in, a strategy of survival on the part of that diaspora. Uh, and so my question to you all would be, um, is, I'd be curious to hear uh, strategies of survival. Uh, you know, if, if we're, particularly if we're framing diaspora by reference to genocide, somebody tried to kill them, <laughs> but they did not succeed. And so to what extent uh, is there a consciousness of strategies of survival, strategies that can allow to sort of confront and negate this thing. There, there's a wonderful line that I use in, in, in one of my books from Frederick Douglass. It says, to the 19th century concern that, well, uh, uh, basically white racism is going to wipe out all the black people on the planet, that to which he says, we ain't dead yet, and we ain't going to die, right? So, so that maybe this is sort of a, a bit premature. But anyway, strategies of survival. Yeah, well, I mean, that's why I structured my presentation around the We Charge Genocide campaign of 1951, because I think that's a strategy of survival, of naming and reclaiming the terminology to diagnose what the systemic problem is, what the living conditions are, um, and Black people defining their own living conditions and speaking back to uh, structures of power, I think, is, is has been a huge uh, and a hugely important point to shifting, as uh, uh, Tim mentioned, in terms of you know the ways that genocide studies sort of gatekeeps um, particular types of of knowledge. Um, black people by writing themselves into that space, like regardless of whatever your definition is, we're going to be here, um, and we're going to you know go to the to the highest uh, sort of you know uh, governmental, international governmental entity that we have, the United Nations. 
Um, and not only you know, are folks going in 1951, but then also in 2014, um, young folks, uh, teenagers are going um, from Chicago uh, to once again reclaim this We Charge Genocide uh, campaign. And, and you can see that, I mean, as you said, going back to the 16th century, you have a number of uh, folks who are writing against uh, both epistemic erasure as well as um, uh, these physical forms of violence. Um, but then you also have ways that um, there is joy and different types of um, technologies that people invent to help them to live through particular acts of genocide. So for me, um, I work with the Rastafari movement. And one of the concepts that arises in the Rastafari movement is the idea of eternal life. So, okay, you know, this whole narrative around perpetual Black death, we're going to just refute that by saying we don't believe in death. <laughs> we don't die. <laughs> so you can try to kill us, but we're not, you know, we're not dead. Um, and, you know, so that type of uh, eternal uh, life framework is, is directly responsive to um, external conditions that people are facing, but also innovative of the sort of ways that people are creating narratives for themselves where they can survive and they will survive no matter what um, the conditions are that they're going through. Um, yeah, I think so one, you know, Jews are human beings. So one response is uh, violence, you know, and, and self-defense. And so going back to the Spanish example, Hasley Crescas wrote about 1391. And he describes that, you know, about probably one third of the, the community of Jews in Spain defended themselves or they found shelter uh, in um, uh, non-Jews, uh, you know, bishops or local magistrates that could shelter them. And that's a, that's a strategy that's used also in Kamonitsky. Uh, Jews run to the Polish overlords, and yet many times the Ukrainians had already killed the Poles and taken their uniforms. It's described in Evan Mitsula, uh text describing this. Anyways, uh, so, so violence and self-defense is one strategy. Uh, and when that's not available, then I would say messianism is the is the psychological defense mechanism of living in a diaspora or being a subaltern, because it, sa it says in most messianism is vengeful, and it says that and Jewish studies has artificially kind of made a difference between Ashkenazi and Sephardi um, uh, messianism, one being vengeful, one not. But we, I think as a field, we realize that that's probably not the case. Uh, that there's plenty of vengeful thinking. Uh, but to give you one example, in the Crusades, one argument is, is why there was so many, so much Ashkenazi martyrdom that goes way beyond what the Talmud requires for martyrs is the belief that every time a Jew dies, like God's shroud is splattered with the blood of Jews. And the bloodier God's shroud is at the end of days, uh, the more angry he's going to be at the non-Jews and he's going to you know, sh shroud them in blood, as much blood as has been shed of the Jews. You know, this is a, obviously a fiction. But it, and it's a revenge fantasy. But revenge fantasy is the is a is a psychological defense mechanism. Uh, so I think that that's one of the most powerful. And then and then another thing is Jews police themselves internally. You see that in Spain too. Uh, when the Converso crisis started to happen, so in the 1430s, the Jews had their own synod, and they told everybody stop wearing fancy clothes. Uh, you know, they 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 threatened anybody that goes to a non-Jewish court with serious uh, punishments. So you see, like you know, being internal, closing the doors, um, trying to not engage with non-Jewish culture is another another way of uh, self-defense. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more, Andrew, about this. I like. That's how I, when I've written about diaspora, I frame it as a strategy of survival, right? And like that, I think, uh, I don't, you know, I have, rather than kind of framing this as like, oh, particular groups of human beings have a proclivity to maintain their culture and identity, right? Which I think is somehow it gets kind of, I don't know, my students or other people might kind of popular takes are that. But saying like, we are all in, you know, um, uh, participating in structures of in the same structure of power and we are kind of integrated in that structure of power in different ways and for certain groups diaspora is a way to to navigate that and that also then we see kind of kind of the creativity and the creation of beauty in those cultures of diaspora um, but these are very much about how to survive and that's what um, and and sometimes uh, diasporic ties, are useful in particular historical moments and times. And then other times, you know, they may not be. And then that 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 part of one's identity might become less important. 
but certainly that's you know the way that I, I think about it. And it speaks, I think, to Volker's point about kind of these cycles of displacement and diaspora as a way to navigate uh, that that situation. So as a follow-up of Andrew's question, I would like to change the narrative from strategies of survival to strategies of resilience. It's not the same. And uh, that if we, if we shift the focus to resilience, maybe we need to pay more attention to culture. And now my questions are going to be to the Stanley's. Uh, a, could you elaborate more on your understanding of the relationship between Judaism versus the Jewish people? You seem to like to separate the two, but I would uh, kind of challenge you on that. And my, the point of the challenge is to put more emphasis on the hermeneutical activity of being Jewish. Uh, we just celebrated Passover, right? Passover is the most important hermeneutical activity the Jews engage in knowing beyond unknowingly, which leads me to a third question, and that's the role of secularism and secularization in the modern Jewish experience, which might explain why the Holocaust takes such a central space here. So if within the, the traditional religious paradigm, anti-Semitism is alive and well and will always be there, so nothing to get too excited about. It's part of being Jewish. Uh, whereas to the secularist, that's really an offensive uh, thing. So that yeah. might just some life of what's yeah. going on. Uh, yeah, uh, the... Uh... So, so resiliency, yeah, a good example might be the ghetto in Venice, right? The kid, you know, the Jews were ghettoized in 1515 in Venice, and then it followed as part of the Catholic Reformation throughout. This is where the term ghetto comes from. It's from the Venetian ghetto. It's uh, across from a foundry, the same word. Uh, so, uh, you know, in, in that case, literal walls built around the community, the gates locked, curfews imposed, and you had here for forced, uh, forced sermons from Dominicans. This was the, or from papal agents, this was what it, what it looked like to be in Italy in the 16th century. But here's the thing, you would think that being, in, get, being ghettoized would really be counterproductive to creativity, but the opposite is true. Uh, you see, the, the Jews enter one of the most incredibly productive period hermeneutical internal discussions of their own text, but also engaging in secularism. The Zari de Rassi lives in the ghetto. Um, uh, the author Shilte Giborim, um, Evron Pantoleone, lived in the Mantua ghetto. So they produce some of the best works, uh, some of the most incredibly deep works of Jewish cultural thought that were intermingled with, with, with the trends of the Renaissance. So the, the, the walls of a ghetto were only that. They were only physical walls. They weren't spiritual, cultural, intellectual barriers. Um, so th 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 that, and that is resiliency, right? Is that, is that the Jewish tradition is never lost, right? It continues and it continues to develop and grow to this very day. And secularism is part of that Jewish tradition, right? Secularism, secularism uh, of Jewish thought is part of the Jewish tradition. Um, now, I make a, I, I try to make a, a division between the Jewish people and, the, and Judaism for a lot of reasons. I guess I've gotten to that mode because of teaching. One is to make a, make a distinction between Jews and other Abrahamic faiths, that one is an ethnicity and a religion, and you know, as opposed to being a universal religion like Christianity or Islam, right? You have to study Jews a little bit differently because religion is only one part of it. Ethnicity is the other part, and the Inquisition and the Converso crisis is a great example. So Jews were killed in mass in 1391. Many of them converted. Uh, and by 1414, 1415, the converts were largely sincerely Catholics. But that didn't matter because in 1480, the Inquisition was established. And the assumption was is that Conversos, no matter how sincerely Catholic they were, because of their Jewish ancestry, were not to be trusted as Catholics. Um, so that is, that is the outside influence telling you that, that it's not about religion, really. And you see Jews internalizing that. So my Portuguese Jews, they don't think about religion really at all. For them, the cohesiveness is not religion, it's ethnicity. And they do this because they've been cut off from Judaism as a religion for two, de for two centuries or more, been cut off. Now they're trying to define themselves as Jews again, these Portuguese in the 18th century that I study. Um, so for them, religion isn't what matters, it's ethnic peoplehood. They give, for instance, they give the dowries to conversal women, but they won't give the dowries to Ashkenazim which is part of this internal, like everybody else to, to the whole other, everybody else in the world, they're just Jews. But internally, you know, an, a, a Sephardi wants nothing to do with an Ashkenazi. You can't get communal honors. You can't be buried in the, you know, the, there's all kinds of uh, discrimination. And in the 17th century, where there were 30,000 Ashkenazi refugees from, uh, from Eastern Europe, they come to Amsterdam and the Portuguese Jews in Amsterdam say, no, thank you. We don't want you bearded Ashkenazim here. So there's a lot of these internal 
uh, divisions that the outside world doesn't see at all. Um, but yeah, I, but I, I guess to answer you, I'm in agreement with you that that cultural uh, that, that cultural development development is resiliency of a diaspora. Yeah. So th thank you all. Um, my question is is based on something Stan that you said, but I think it applies at the wrestling with this relationship between diaspora and genocide. Think about the state, you know, where does it fit in the process? I think genocide is in 10 stages, where is diaspora along that? Um, but I think, you know, I, I, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts and see if the rest of the panel had additional thoughts on this. Uh, but in the case of the Holocaust, it's a well known example of genocide that the world kind of is, is generally focused on. I think, you know, you talked about how that's uh, overshadowed, you know, you, you covered a lot of Jewish history in, in 10 minutes. I'm, I'm impressed of, you know, all the things you brought in. How how does the Holocaust though change the the understanding of Jewish diaspora um, in the post Holocaust world? Has Jewish history is like you said, many diasporas. Um, has that concept changed in the post Holocaust world? And, and has the genocide, the very public genocide uh, happening and being recognized, changed that concept of what a diaspora is? Or, yeah, I, I, I'll try to be brief about this because I think the other panelists have th uh, uh, things to say too. But I, but yeah, I think the Holocaust um, in brief, I think it has, uh, the, the result is that it, it gave life uh, and fueled the lacrimose narrative because now it looked like all Jewish history was sort of inevitably leading up to, in the same way like big history looks at all political development is leading up inevitably to democracy. Uh, so too did the Holocaust create this narrative that all Jewish uh, dispossession, all of you are suffering at some point is on this kind of narrative towards a, a teleological backwards looking narrative towards the, the, the Auschwitz and the concentration camps. Um, and so that has colored the way we look at things. So I think so, some of the research, especially in the, like immediately after the Holocaust, studying Jewish diasporas were very focused on sort of the upheavals, very focused on the persecutions, but less focused on the anti-lacrimose things, which could also mean Jews being empowered in ways that are very uncomfortable for Jewish in Jewish history. So an example would be Suriname. And, you know, in Suriname, Jews, uh, Portuguese Jews had complete autonomy in a jungle village, Yodin Savannah, where they owned thousands of slaves, where they where they uh, they amassed the militia to go attack Maroons who were attacking them. This was this is this is the definition of anti-lacrimosity because these are Jews that are empowered in very uncomfortable ways. I, I get that, but also, but they were uh, but they had autonomy. Um, so that kind of narrative is only starting to come out now because we've been so we've been so uh, overshadowed by a lacrimose narrative that you're unwilling to even see ways that Jews were in some ways empowered or had a, some kind of autonomy. Uh, now that was short lived and you know they didn't have the option to be in the government or anything like that of the Dutch government, but they had their own little uh, terrible Jewish village in Suriname. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, the, the, these are important conversations um, and it kind of speaks to this kind of frame, some of the framing questions at the beginning, right? About, I think particularly when you're thinking about, I don't know, uh, Jewish studies or Africana studies or indigenous studies, these, uh, these fields have their own histories and they have kind of different moments, right? Where they, I think we've, some in Stan in my hallway conversations, Talk about like there's moments where I think, uh, for understandable reading reasons, these fields become a, a, about a bit essentialist, right? Like this is our experience; it is unique to us, and no, and it is entirely um, almost unintelligible to people outside of our, you know, our community or this field, right? And then there's other moments in those disciplines where people have a what I would call a kind of internationalist perspective, like a broader perspective that that reckons with the complexity of our own experiences and other people's and their interconnectedness. Um, and I think like there's trade-offs, right? And you, you, for example, like the there's a the 1619 project, right, in the United States, which has got all this experience, you know, all this attention, a backlash. I I actually taught its materials in Mobile, Alabama, which was interesting. Um, but there's also limitations to, I think, I would say there's limitations to that narrative. I also taught it and thought it was productive, right? Because uh, it, want, it, was, it, it is trying to emphasize a particular experience. And so, I don't know, I feel like that, I'm always wrestling with this about how to kind of 
represent the singularity of, uh, of certain indigenous experiences, but also understand how it is, these are intertwined histories, you know, and, um, and it's probably good for us to think in conversation with each other, right? Like that's, I think, where like, we might figure things out more. Okay, actually, yes, go ahead. Thank you very much for your presentation. I have one quick comment and a question for all of you. Um, so the quick comment is, in some ways this brings together your two presentations, is that some of you may not be aware of another riot that actually occurred in 1898 in Wilmington, North Carolina, uh, which is often referred to as second only devastation to the Tulsa riot. So there often are these parts of history that don't get the same kind of attention as other more primitive parts of the history of the Muslim lives on the piece of our July groups. Um, and then as a quick question, is that something that occurred to me as each one of you are talking, go back to these phases and can butt for our whole land. But the way that that unfolds in each of these groups is very different. Um, you know, like, so the 1948, of course, establishment of Israel, right, is often seen as like the pinnacle of that opportunity. The fact that many Africans cannot trace back because of the structure of records where home might be. And there's that period in Liberia where there might've been this, you know, this, this mass kind of migration. And of course, we do have reservations where supposedly there's been an opportunity for land, but it's very problematic how that system has worked. So if each of you, like from your own perspectives, talk a little bit about how this idea of a return to the whole land of the diaspora is kind of a complicated uh, kind of idea. And, and um, we are at time, but I think we have time to finish this we'll question. Yeah, but I I'm was, sorry. Yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, I was, I just want to make sure with the organizers that this is good. It's good. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's a really great question. Um, and so my work actually thinks about the ways that Rastafari people repatriate to different parts of the continent, specifically Ghana, um, but also tangentially Ethiopia. Um, and, you know, along with the 1619 project, uh, Ghana had the year of return, um, which was happening at the same time in 2019, that was calling for African diasporas to come back home. You know, even though, yes, as you mentioned, most people cannot trace um, their particular ancestry, um, but uh, different African countries have positioned themselves as being a sort of homeland, Ghana being one of them. Um, and Ghana has also offered citizenship um, to certain people who are returning home. Um, but the return home has always been complicated, as you mentioned, um, the Liberia case, uh, Liberia, as well as Sierra Leone, there was the, um, in the 19th century, there was the American Colonization Society that was uh, trying to force, basically, Black folks to go back to Africa after the abolition of uh, slavery. So American some of it, colonization. yeah, American Colonization Society, some of it was not necessarily voluntary, um, where people were being removed um, to go back. And some of it was actually voluntary where people were resettling. And then you have, you in different parts of the African diaspora, you have different types of settlements, um, particularly within West Africa, like Brazilians, you have Brazilians who are going back as early as like the 18th century um, to different parts of Africa. Um, but these, when folks go back because of the, internal, as uh, both Shane and uh, Stan have been talking about, both the uh, sort of internal realities of the fact that, you know, okay, yes, we're all Black, or we're all maybe identifying as African, but we actually don't maybe speak the same language, we don't eat the same foods, we don't, you know, have the same histories in common. Um, and then, you know, in some, a place like Ghana, you know, things are really based on your clan, your ethnic group, where you come from. So are you Ga, are you Ewe, are you Fonti, are you, you know, Ashanti, whatever, you know, whatever. And African-Americans or folks um, in the African diaspora more generally don't necessarily have a, a particular claim um, to that. Um, and part of the, part of the ways that, uh, that Ghana is also defining the African diaspora is more of an economic sort of advantage in terms of, um, you know, resources um, that Ghana and other parts of Africa can gain from a return of the African diaspora. So it's not necessarily like, you know, we're all brothers and sisters. It's like, you know, well, there is a, a financial incentive and investment here. Um, so those are some of the sort of entanglements um, that I can. Yeah, that's an excellent question. We could do a whole yes. <laughs> panel just on that, the question of kind of return and 
you know, as a native person, I am in favor of everyone returning to their ancestral lands. Uh, <laughs> no, but uh, but uh, no, but it, I think it's a really important question. Uh, you know, I, and as I said, right, it's like um, in my kind of opening remarks, you know, uh, the Choctaw land is land that was was not traditional land, but land that was given through treaty that has now been, you know, the McGirt decision has now kind of re-recognized our reservation lands in southeastern Oklahoma. And so there's a there's that complication there, right, about uh, what is homeland. Um, and so there's, there would be lots of things to say. The one thing I would say is like when, you know, when you think about kind of indigenous ideas of sovereignty or relationship to the land, I mean, what I find kind of most interesting or productive to think about is rather than say like kind of, although questions of legal sovereignty and jurisdiction are important, I do think that thinking about, I mean, native conceptions of the relationship to the land is really about like reciprocal relationships, right? Like it's not just kind of a, I don't know, like a more modern conception of private property and land, but rather that like we are in relationship to the land, to the living world more broadly, and that that is something that um, much of society has lost, right? Is that we think of land as something to be owned or something to be exploited, just like other parts of the natural world. And I think thinking about you know, indigenous forms of kind of reciprocal relationships to the land and to other living beings is like, uh, is really important, right? Because our, our um, death, you know, our, our livelihood is in, entwined with each other and in entwined with the natural world. And us thinking about that and centering that as much as possible, I think is like important for imagining a, a better world in the future. Uh, yeah, I, I'll be brief, and I think it's an opportunity to answer Chava's question, which I didn't answer before, which is why it's so important to separate Judaism from the Jewish people. So uh, Judaism is a very clear answer to this. The longing to return, that's to the land of Israel, to Zion. This is part of Jewish liturgy for thousands of years, part of rabbinic thought that, uh, that the messianic redemption is connected to the land of Israel. So for Judaism, longing to return is clear that, that it's referring to messianic uh, restoration in the land of Israel. But when you kind of take Judaism out of the equation of the Jewish people, then what does longing to return look like? And I see, and that could be to the sub diasporas, diasporas within diasporas. So the example would be all the Portuguese conversos who show up in Amsterdam or show up in London, and the rabbis are at a constant, they're, they're constantly struggling to keep these people from going back to Iberia the lands of idolatry, and they don't allow them to do it. Going back means you can't get communal honors, can't get buried, uh, but they do. They, they're going back and forth all the time, changing their religions. They go back and forth. They, they go to the Inquisition. They tell them what they did. The Inquisition makes them wear a San Benito. They do their business, and then they go back to Amsterdam. They don't get circumcised, even though the rabbis are telling them to. I would say that their concept of longing to return would be to Iberia, right, and not to the land of Israel. Um, so I think that um, separating Judaism and, and the Jewish people is helpful in thinking about longing to return. And also, uh, I don't know how much they emphasize 1948 or not, because that wasn't exactly a religious uh, endeavor. And, um, and also, there were other moments when Jews tried to, the Jews or Jewish ethnic, uh, people who are ethnically Jews, tried to create landed states for themselves. The Frankists tried to do this in, the, in, in Poland in the, 17th, in the 18th century. Uh, the, uh, uh, there were efforts um, to, to create Jewish settlements in Curaçao, uh, in, in Livorno. Uh, Jews had a wide diaspora within themselves. The, 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 me the metropole of that diaspora was Livorno, but the Jewish traders in the 18th century were in Aleppo, were in Algeria. They were all looking to a central community that was to Livorno in Italy, Leghorn. Uh, so um, what is longing to return for the Jewish people is a complicated question, I think. So I wanted to actually, if, if you'll indulge me, your question about homeland is actually really interesting because I've been thinking about some of the concepts of diaspora, especially um, in this conversation and in relation to thinking about um, uh, migrants and in the US and especially deportees. And there's a legal scholar named Daniel Canstrom who wrote a book called Deportation Nation, sort of thinking about how the number of people who've been deported, you could create a huge nation. Um, and thinking, you know, they are not, they're obviously immigrants to the United States, but many of them had lived here for time, had homes, had families, had like this was their homeland in some respect. And so um, thinking about deportees as kind of a diasporic uh, nation, uh, I'm just kind of wondering if that would work. And so I'm just kind of 
This conversation has been very interesting for me to think about some of these questions. I want to thank our, our panelists, um, my colleagues here for producing such um, uh, generative um, presentations and conversations. And I want to thank the audience members for, for participating as well. Thank you.